Well, our study for today is entitled, Born of Water and of the Spirit. Our lesson for today is named, Born of the Water and of the Spirit, and this title is taken right from the Bible, and I believe, like most things in the Bible, there are two different ways to understand the statement. And we're going to talk about that as we go through our study together today. I want to begin by reading from 2 Kings chapter, chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because... By him the Lord had given him de given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. This is the Old Testament story of Naaman the leper. Notice what it says about this man here. He was the captain of the host, the army of the king of Syria. It also says that he was a great man with his master because by him the Lord had delivered Syria. And I'm not sure that the Syrians would have stated it just that way. But who knows, maybe his master, the king, did know and understand about the true God. Probably he was credited with winning this battle that delivered his people. It definitely says that he was a mighty man in valor. So he was known for his bravery in battle when they fought. But there is one more piece of information given about him here. He was a leper. And we know that this was one of the most pitiful conditions that is discussed in all the Bible. Go on with verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. You probably know the story here. Thanks to a little Hebrew girl who was the maid who waited on Naaman's wife because she tells her mistress that if Naaman would go to the prophet Elisha that he would surely be healed. What a wonderful way to witness for the Lord. When we see people struggling with the problems of life, do we tell them that they should go and see the prophet of the Lord? Check out the Bible? Jesus? But somebody tells the king about this, and the king himself tells Naaman to go and see this prophet in Israel. And so Naaman comes with all his horses and stands at the door of Elisha. But Elisha doesn't come to the door. He sends a messenger out unto him with a message to go and wash himself in the Jordan River seven times. And don't miss this. He promises that he will be cleansed of his leprosy if he does this. Right? Mm -hmm. Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Surely this man was accustomed to getting special treatment, right? After all, he was a part of the king's court. And so Naaman is angry. What do we call it when someone who is accustomed to special treatment and they get angry when things don't happen just as they think that they ought to. Pride and arrogance. 
Pride, arrogance. Spoiled. Spoiled was the word I was going to use. <laughs> That's right. Spoiled. And he explains. He thought that the prophet would surely come out and see him and talk to him and make a big show of healing him in front of everyone. Right? And so Naaman does just exactly what any spoiled brat would do in a similar situation. He pitches a fit. Right? He throws a tantrum, if you will, and he leaves. And then, in verse 12, are not Abana and Thapar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He got his feelings hurt. He got his feelings hurt. And he showed it. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Those servants really liked him. Yeah. Now this is kind of neat here. How did this whole thing get started? The little Hebrew servant girl told him that what told him what he should do, right? And now who is reasoning with him and telling him what he should do? Do you think that Naaman was accustomed to taking advice from his servants? So, do you think there was a very special lesson that this man needed to learn? And that this is why the Lord is allowing all of this to happen in just this way. Now, the first little slave girl knew something of the truth and the ways of the man of God. But here, even this slave makes more sense out of the situation than Naaman did. If the prophet had asked you of some great thing, you would have done it. That's what he said. So why not do the simple thing that he is asking of you right now? And then in verse 14, it says, Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a healed person. <laughs> it says the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. So Naaman simply does what he is asked to do. And of course, in order to do this, he has to set aside his great pride, doesn't he? And what is the result of his obedience? He is healed. Right? Did the water of the Jordan River heal him? No. Not really. Not quite. He was absolutely right. There was nothing special about the Jordan River and probably every one of those other rivers were nicer than the Jordan. It was not the Jordan River that healed Naaman. It was God who healed Naaman. But, can we take another lesson from this? When we go to God for help, does He usually give us something to do? Yeah. I mean, there's a lesson for all of us in this. Is it usually some great thing or is it usually a relatively small and simple thing? Remember, very often God uses the natural things to get supernatural results. Why? What 
we will give him. What will we give him in response? Maybe that we will give him all the glory. Amen? Amen. What really healed Naaman? His obedience yep. to Elisha's instructions, which were really God's instructions, right? Amen. Just think of how many times Jesus said, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And so, if we are looking for healing from God, what would be the best course to pursue? Do everything that He asks us to do, right? But are we not really talking about physical healing today as much as spiritual healing? The spiritual healing is the greater thing, right? Mm -hmm. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. Just like Naaman was asked to dip in the Jordan seven times, God asked us to show in a very concrete way that we are taking a stand for Him. So what does God ask us to do? In 1 John 2 verse 6, it says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So let's turn our eyes upon Jesus, who is always our perfect example in all things. Amen? In Matthew 3, verses 13 and 14, it says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But, John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? So the Bible says that Jesus came unto John to be baptized of him. And of course, we know that John didn't feel worthy to baptize Jesus. And I don't think that anyone at any time would. Do you? What if you would have been the one that would have been asked to put Jesus into that water? I certainly wouldn't have been worthy. I certainly would not have either. And he at first refuses to do it, doesn't he? But then look at the very next verse, verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. Think about it. Jesus was not a sinner. Amen? Amen. He was the sinless Son of God. So did he need to be baptized? Certainly not the way that you and I need to be baptized, right? But Jesus is plainly teaching John something here, isn't he? And he is also plainly teaching us something here in this great story. Jesus wanted to leave us an example so that we too will fulfill all righteousness in our lives. Amen? John 3, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized them. Now we know that John the Baptist baptized, right? That makes perfect sense. And we know that Jesus was baptized of him in that same river Jordan that Naaman was cleansed in. 
But did you know that Jesus and his disciples baptized many others? Now I will tell you that there is some confusion about this and there are so many different ways that statements could be taken. We don't really know everything for sure. But this we do know. The disciples of Jesus did baptize many other converts. Did Jesus baptize his followers with the Holy Spirit? And so there is no doubt that Jesus taught the doctrine of baptism and that he commanded his disciples to do so. Please look at Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Jesus definitely taught the importance of baptism, didn't he? And just before leaving them and ascending to heaven, Jesus commanded them to baptize each and every new convert in his name. But look at what it says in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? But look at verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So what is the meaning of baptism? Baptism is symbolic. And its meaning is this. It is to show that we are dead to our sins and that we leave behind the old man and his old ways. Right? And then because we die with Christ, we are also allowed to resurrect with Christ. Aren't we? And be baptized in the Spirit of God so that we now walk in newness of life. That means reborn, being born again, doesn't it? And let's look at this in the very next verses. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So baptism symbolizes the replacement of the old man. Amen? The carnal man with the new man. The spiritual man. Isn't that awesome? Here's another verse that puts it very, very plainly. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Remember I told you the gospel is not just about forgiveness of our sins, but the real point is taking away the sin problem from us. Amen? Colossians 2 and verse 12 says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him 
through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. The whole point to our baptism is that we are crucified with Christ. Amen? And then we're reborn and we become some, something completely new. Back in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But, what else are we? Alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to that. We are to reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin. Isn't that right? But, at the same time that we're dead unto sin, we are proclaimed to be alive unto God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's another great verse about this. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, it's not me that lives, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So again, Paul likens it to our being crucified on the cross with Jesus. Right? At least spiritually, and so our old man is dead. But the new man, is he dead? No. He is alive because Jesus is alive and living inside of us. And so let's look at the baptism and see what the Bible says about the actual service. Matthew 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Amen? The first thing we know about this service is that it is a public service, isn't it? It's a public presentation. A large part of this is that we are doing it before the whole congregation. Right? And then, Ephesians 4, verse 5, says it so wonderfully. That there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So how many different kinds of baptism are there? There's really only one. Now, you've probably heard some of my presentations. There's all kinds of crazy baptismal series that are done. But of the ceremony of baptism, how many different ways are there actually to perform this ceremony? There's really only one. If you ask that question of the almost 500 denominations that we have in this country today, how many different answers do you think you would get? At least. You would get a ton of them. Out of 500, you might get 200 or more. Some people believe in immersion. Some by sprinkling. Some by pouring. Joe Cruz used to tell of some church that baptized people with rose petals. 
And I think it was Doug Batchelor who told of some hippies who were baptizing people in Coca-Cola. <laughs> there may be a hundred different ways of doing it, but how many does the Bible account for? Just one. We said it from the very beginning of our studies together, and I think it bears repeating. If the Bible gives us the details of the baptism ceremony, then don't we need to follow those details? Some people think that the details just aren't very important. But then why are they given to us? Why is the Bible filled with these things? Some people think the details aren't important. But we know that they are. According to the Bible, there is only one Lord. And so, there is only one faith. And so, there is only one baptism. Right? John 3, verse 23. John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. So let's be clear about this. The only kind of baptism that the Bible teaches is baptism by immersion. The candidate is to be plunged into the water to be baptized. Isn't that right? This is why it says there needed to be much water in order to baptize. In fact, the very word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to fully immerse and to plunge down into the water. I would also bring your attention to the fact that this is John 3.23. And John 3.23 obviously comes right after John 3.16, doesn't it? John 3.16, one of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So wonderful. Well, in Matthew 3.16, we read another important verse. And Jesus, when He was baptized went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, upon him himself. So how was Jesus baptized? It is obvious here that he was put down into the water all the way because he then comes up out of the water, right? And not only does John the Baptist perform this, but Jesus accepts it and our Heavenly Father approves of it. Isn't that right? Acts 8, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So they picked the place. Why? Because of the amount of water that was there. Alright? 
Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So they both go down into the water, right? Verse 39, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. They both come up out of the water. Can there be any doubt about that? If sprinkling were enough, then why did they go down into the water? And remember what we just read. It symbolizes death and burial, right? There's only one way of baptism that can do that. It has to be immersion. We have to put the person's body all the way down into the water, don't we? It just has to be immersion. Well, I've got a neat picture for you to look at. But I want to ask a question. Who then can be baptized? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all of the nations and baptize them and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Right? So are there preliminary qualifications for baptism? Sure. Sure there are. The candidate must have faith in Jesus. Right? And he needs to have repentance for his sins. And they're going to need to understand that they are being crucified to those sins. Right? So, my only question is, can a baby like this fulfill those conditions? They don't know. I know that the baby is cute. And that's really why I put his picture up there. Well, he's a, what we would call an innocent. He's, he's just a little innocent. That's right. He's not aware. That is absolutely right. That doesn't make it right, does it? What makes it actually wrong? It makes it actually wrong. In Mark 1 and verse 5, it says, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Who's that talking about? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. That's exactly right. What did it take to be baptized of John the Baptist? A river It took a lot of water, but it mainly took the confession of their sins. Can the baby do that? We could even ask the question, does the baby need to do that? It just doesn't really make sense, does it? In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men 
and women. What did it take here? They had to believe the teaching about Jesus, didn't they? You should also notice that it mentions that there were men and women. Is there anything said about children? But there's something very important that we cannot leave out here. We are to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Isn't that right? Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What exactly did it take here? Repentance. Repentance for what? Repentance for your sins. Right? Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. Right? What does it say in verse 22? And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove unto Him. What does that mean? In a bodily shape like unto a dove. What does that mean? He could see it. He could see it. It, the Holy Ghost, descended and it took a bodily shape. What kind of body? Like a little dove. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. When Jesus, our perfect example, was baptized, what else happened? The Holy Spirit of God came down and lighted upon Him. What did this represent? Folks, that's an easy one. We just read it. Thou art my beloved Son. In Thee I am well pleased. And also, Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is the promise from God's own words? If we take a stand for God in baptism, we can rely on Him to baptize us with His Holy Spirit. Right? And help us to do all that He has asked us to do. Isn't that an awesome promise? This is just exactly why Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Listen, the act of baptism is a very important one for the Christian, right? But it is also important that we understand this, that not even baptism will save us in and of itself. 
We are not saved by getting baptized. But we are baptized because we want to show that God is saving us. Very close, but very different. We want to be faithful to God's call and God's command. Yes, getting baptized in the water is important. It is so important. But the really important thing is to be baptized in God's Spirit. Amen? That's what Jesus is talking about in these verses. Mark 16 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not, will he be saved? He'll be damned. Remember the thief on the cross. He wasn't able to follow through on this command. And that's okay because I believe that Jesus was baptized for him. But there is no escaping this Bible verse. We must be baptized by God's Holy Spirit. No exceptions. Every last one of us must be baptized by God's Holy Spirit. Amen? John 13 and verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Jesus says He has set the example. And if we are His... He will follow that example. Right? We will follow that example. And this would be a great Bible verse for us to end on. And I hope that part of your brain will just fix on this statement and remember it as we close today. But I just have to show you one more Bible verse before we stop. John 13, 15 says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In Acts 22 and verse 16, it says, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you have never been baptized or feel that you would like to be baptized again, please don't hesitate. Come and talk with me. And let's make preparations for that important event in your life and in our church life. Amen? But I would imagine that most all of us have been baptized. Our next lesson, do this in remembrance of me. There's something just ahead of us here that is of the most importance. There is something so very important, and it is something that every single one of us need to have done in our lives. Yes, there is something that we each need to have taken care of in our own lives. And it is of the utmost importance. So please don't miss out on our next lesson. We each need to make sure that we are here for this next one. Amen? Let's open up our song books to number 462.
and sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's stand together as we sing.